get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, Our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 creates 100% outsourced VIP special event or mini conferences for software company or large conference organizers. Basically, what we do is we help People put their highest level customer in the room to network and collaborate so they can get more referrals, increase retention with those highest level customers, and also get more engaged new customers. We work with events that have 10,000 attendees and ones that have 500 attendees. So if your company is looking to bring on and you know bring your highest level customers together to connect and collaborate, go to rise25.com and learn more. Uh, the second sponsor is Audible. Uh, I listen to three to five books per week, granted on two times speed. So my book of the week, probably even the year, Nate, I'm wondering if you've listened to this one, is Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Uh, He's a former international hostage hostage negotiator for the FBI. It's amazing stories. And you could check out my interview with Chris uh, in inspiredinsider.com. Um, today I'm very excited, uh, long awaited. We have Nate Lind, the founder of Ad Summit Conference and the Legends High Level Group and a multi-million dollar e-commerce company selling hair care products for women and men. We're talking about conferences, collaboration. You know, you have to check out adsum.net. Uh, he's had a fascinating journey going from canning pack house to his education at the Art Institute to a junior programmer to selling and buying $50 million of real estate, to consultant to Fortune 500 banks, to multi-million dollar e-commerce company, to add some, the online sellers summit, who helps online retailers. Nate, we'll dive into these things. And I'm excited because we're gonna talk about some of the pillars on how to diversify off Amazon. Well, Nate, thanks for having me thanks on. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely, I appreciate you having me on. No, I haven't. I haven't listened to uh, uh, to that particular book. my my book of the re- uh, My book of the week right now is yeah. Expert Secrets by Russell Brunson. Okay, that's a good one. Totally. Yep. Thank you. Absolutely. Add it so, to the Audible, everyone. Yeah. Um, so Nate, when I'm thinking about you, um, you know, I just the word transformation always comes up for me. You know, you've had all these transformations um, in your health and your business. Um, but I have some fun facts that I wrote down about you okay. in my research. So I want to talk about a few of them. One is right. you grew up as youngest of six. Yes, that's so right. I'm, what was that like? I'm, I'm the youngest of six. It's kind of like a Brady Bunch family. We had uh, three boys and three girls. Um, and yeah, it was, it was really interesting because we, we moved around quite a bit. My dad was in the army and I always had, you know, older brothers and sisters, you know, looking after me, telling me what to do, you know, teaching me that sort of stuff. And I think I can, I was thinking about this the day, actually, I, I've derived a lot of, I think that, uh, that curious mind and also like listening to, listening to others who have walked a path ahead of me. And been willing to um, to to take in like their their words of wisdom, and and let that guide or steer me, so I didn't step in the same potholes or, or pitfalls that mm-hmm. maybe they have. Who was some of the mentors early on, and then I want to hear about later on. But who mentored you? I mean, you were the youngest of six. Are you just grabbing for attention wherever um, possible? Or? Not so much. No. I, I mean, I, I so I had one brother that was just about like a, just barely a year year and a half or so older than me. So we we hung out quite a bit, and we I mean that close of a relationship. Of course, you when you're getting a little bit older, you do a lot of you know fighting and that sort of stuff. And then, but he's still you know as we got older, you know one of one of my closest friends. Uh, my oldest brother um, actually worked for me for about four years and is working mm. uh, working for me again now on on AdSum, helping with uh, you know companies that are interested in and in being uh, in front of online retailers. You know if they have provide a service, they you know he's been helping them. So um, at one various stage or another, I've <laughs> I've actually employed most of my older brothers or really? sisters. Um, but early on, uh, I didn't I don't. I don't really think I had like one particularly strong mentor until uh, until after uh, after college. I had one in in real estate, and still a dear friend of mine. He's, he's my partner in uh, the Legends Mastermind now. 
um, Mark Overman has just been a, a tremendous influence on um, on teaching me a number of things. And you know, now from being a mentor to now being a partner, it's, that's been a uh, been a really cool opportunity too. Yeah, and and I was reading too. Um, you know, you had to travel around a lot every couple of years because your dad was an army officer. What mm-hmm. was it like? Um, Growing up with a dad as an army officer, what were some of the things that, that he did, you think, because it's unique to, to his job? We So he wasn't around a whole lot like day to day, but we did do trips. So um, he was responsible for, um, he, was, he was a staff officer, so he was responsible for a lot of the administrative work uh, that went on for the Army Reserve Association and the Army during Desert Shield, Desert Storm in the 90s. Mm. So he would go, he would do these, these basically these road trips. Uh, to all of these different, um, you know, forts and establishments and stuff that the army had set up in, in the U.S. and you know help them from their, you know, with their mobilization, po- you know, practices, policies, procedures, that sort of stuff. And uh, from time to time, we would do it as a family. I remember a couple times in the summer, um, you know, we'd, you know, the army would pay to rent a car, and then. Um, <laughs> Okay, I got to tell a story. So, Go ahead, yeah. the the army would pay to rent a car, and then we would all drive around together um, and go to these different these different areas. It's totally off topic. So this is just... eight people in a car. How many people? No, are... no, no, no. This at this point okay. in time, it was just my my next older brother and okay. I. It would have been a, would have be been like... a fiasco. To... Yeah, totally. <laughs> that would be a good story all on its own. But um, this one particular trip. <clears throat> We uh, we were we were based out of St. Louis at the time, and we were we were driving you know somewhere down uh, I uh, I think it's like Interstate 44, and um, you know back in I think this was in the 90s, so th- this specific car didn't have like really good uh, cup holders, and uh, he had put this you know these kind of like kind of El Cheapo like cup holders that you can kind of like put in the in totally. the window yes, yeah yeah. And then had this big gulp basically sitting in it. And when, you know, we all got out to go into this restaurant, she, you know, he shuts the door and this this big gulp like flings right out, right out of the cup holder into the chair and is glug, 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 glug. You can see all <laughs> of this Coke, you know, Coca-Cola just like seeping into the car. So those are the, uh, those are some of the, the, the craziness, you know, stories that we would have traveling around. But what I remember most about my dad is he worked a ton, mm. but he still cared and, and loved and wanted to spend a lot of time with us, uh, but didn't really have much in the way of the opportunity to do that just kind of day in and day out. Like he would, you know, he's working, you know, 10, 12 hour days and, yeah. and depending on where we lived uh, in the D.C. area, we lived for a while. He, you know, he had a, you know, had a commute and stuff. So we didn't see him a lot, but he made up for it, uh, I think, in taking us on some of these uh, these road trips. And I would read books and just kind of sit in the back seat and be driven around kind of like driving Miss 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 Daisy. And yeah. and um, that was something that I remember uh, quite fondly yeah. growing up. It's a tough balance, you know, working family. How do you strike that? I don't even like the word balance. But how do you strike that chaos? I don't know. Yeah, it's um, you know, I've, I've heard someone talk about like there is no like balance in the world of like entrepreneurship is is baloney. Like it just it doesn't happen. There's there's periods of time when you have sprints, and then there's totally. periods of time where you have rest, and uh, it it is really difficult to balance it. And as I've become a father, and I've got a, a four year old and a nine year old, I struggle with it a lot too. Yeah. And you know, have found that I've been in sprint mode for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. and it's like you're running a marathon as a sprint, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you're not paying attention to them. You're not you're not focused on them. And and uh, you know, I found myself um, you know being being reminded by my loving wife, uh, who was you know reaching out to me and, and and trying to you know trying to bridge that gap, trying to like you know. It's like I was on a tether outside of a space station. She's trying to like pull me back in, and I'm like, "No, I've got to fix the space station. It's gonna blow up if I don't." And uh, meanwhile, right. she's like, "No, it's not. Get your ass in here." <laughs> you and, get a big uh, head slap in the back. <laughs> <Boom>. <laughs> exactly. Um, so it, it's it's uh, you know constantly being reminded that uh, it, there is real no balance. There there is there's sprint times, but there's also times of rest where you have to come back. Uh, you know, spend that time with your family. You know, as as men, I've done a lot of research. I've read a ton of books, um, and and really just seat myself in you know kind of that evolutionary psychology perspective of you know how we're still just cavemen out there trying to hunt for our next meal. Totally, yeah. And, and, and providers, bring, right? Provide exactly. Just you know, providing and protecting. You know, procreating the three P's of masculinity. I mean, procreating. Most of us don't need any help with. We figured that part out. Um, providing uh, is is a big thing that we spend a ton of time on, and then protecting. We don't really have to do quite so much of that because of you know the military, the police, firefighters, right. that sort of stuff. So we go into overdrive on on trying to provide. 
Um, mm. and, and then that's where things can kind of get askew us as entrepreneurs and, and get out of that, uh, get out of that balance. So, uh, one key thing I would just suggest to all your, all totally. your listeners and is, myself. Yes. Keep going. And, and, and I have to remind yeah. myself too, is when, when you're with your family, put your phone on, do not disturb, put it on, uh, on airplane mode and set it aside. Um, just do that for, a, you know, a couple hours a week when you're spending time with your family, they'll notice it, they'll appreciate it. Um, whatever deadline that you have, it's coming up. It can wait an hour. It can wait a couple hours. And, um, yeah, I learned that one the hard way and, and it, uh, made for some very painful conversations, but, uh, it did get me to realize, and sometimes I need that slap up the backside of the head to recognize that, you know, the, the ones that are around me that love me the most, they, they don't they don't necessarily want me outside of the space station constantly working. They want me to come inside and enjoy the time with them too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, Nate, um, what are the things you do, uh, deliberately, you know, cause I feel like with me, things sometimes just happen. I need to more deliberately plan out these type of things. So one is you just kind of put your, your cell phone on silent or airplane mode. Um, what else do you do deliberately, whether it's, you know, a planned trip or, or not that would Bingo. be, so we, we didn't do much in the way of vacationing um, for years. Like I grew up and like our, you know, with, with my parents and our family and, you know, it's expensive to take out six kids. So, you know, we don't. To, don't to do McDonald's it. is expensive. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's crazy expensive. So we didn't do a lot of vacations growing up. And when we did, it usually was traveling to like family. So we had some place to stay. So it was kind of, okay, gas to get there, stay with the family and then, and then travel back. Um, and, and I, you know, honestly, I didn't really do a whole lot of that growing up, you know, or as a young adult either, I would go on some boys trips every once in a while. I love scuba diving, uh, liked it more when I was heavier than, than when I am now and I've lost some weight. It's, I get cold in the water, but I would do some of that. Um, and then most recently, about a year or so ago, uh, we bought some, uh, we bought some property in Cabo San Lucas and, uh, you know, two, mm. two weeks a year or, you know, one week in the beginning of the year and one week at the end of the year, we just, we go down there and my wife and I have an agreement that you know, she's, she also started her own business as a copywriter. So, oh, nice. All of, all of the marketing that I, you know, that we did together, you know, she did a lot of the copy for that. And then, yes. you know, she went on to start her own, uh, her own copywriting company. That's and awesome. so we, we had this agreement that when we're, when we're on vacation, you know, we would each check in, you know, to work, you know, for like an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. And usually it doesn't end up being that long. It ends up yeah. being like 15 or 20 minutes and then turn off the phones, um, put them on vibrate, you know, read books and, and hang out like at the four year old and nine year old, all they want to do is play in the water. So we don't even leave the resort. So we, you know, get food and drinks served to us. We read books. Um, we, the, the last trip we took, we read the five love languages and, uh, mm. that was a super impactful really? book for our relationship. Nice. Um, what kind of copywriter, what kind of copy did she write? Uh, so it's, it's, mar it's marketing, so sales letters, emails, mm -hmm. um, they, um, you know, kind of the whole, uh, the whole suite of stuff for people that are, um, you know, selling their businesses, selling products, selling services, mm -hmm. uh, can be the whole nine yards. What's her website? We could plug it. It's uh, it's conversionhacker.com. Conversion Hacker. That's a good one. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That's always in need. Um, so I want to find out where the canning pack house fits in all this. Yes. So I was 14 years old and uh, maybe 15. I, I was under 16. So at the time I was having, you know, not a whole lot of jobs you can get like on the books. Um, but I had a buddy who was working there and he recommended me to the boss. And, you know, I think there was only a certain number of hours or whatever that I had to comply by, you know, that I could only work a certain number of hours a week or whatever. And, uh, basically the way it worked is, um, this little place in, you know, Arkansas city, Ar Arkansas city, Kansas, spelled like Arkansas. Mm. I used to get teased about how I would pronounce my, my city's name wrong when I moved to Virginia and St. Louis and stuff like I didn't know what my city was called. So our Kansas City, Kansas and this little place in the south side of town would um, they essentially were uh, were filling these bags with liquid like liquid mocha, liquid coffee. And six of them would shoot down this uh, this conveyor belt and I would put them in this box, uh, you know, two on top of each other, three rows wide and then sh send this box down this tape machine and it would tape it up and then it would get stacked on pallets and then get shipped out to California. And, um, yeah, that's kind of w pretty much one of my first jobs that wasn't like mowing the yard or like doing stuff that like, you know, young kids do, but that was the first time I got, you know, kind of a paycheck. And, uh, I was, I think a freshman in high school or yeah, I think it was freshman in high school and I kind of needed to cause my parents, um, they had declared bankruptcy when I think I was like 12 or 13. Mm. 
and we didn't have a lot of money growing up, like, mm. you know, raising six kids. My parents had stretched themselves kind of thin with credit and, and other things. And, you know, we still, for the most part, had things that, you know, we needed to provide for. But certain things were missing. Like, you know, my buddies would get video game systems and, you know, other like toys and fun stuff to, to play with. And um, pretty much I got, you know, one pair of shoes for the school year and I got uh, one school jacket, you know, one winter jacket for that year plus the next year. And so there was a, a sense of, of lacking or a sense of missing. And yeah. I think that that inspired me to to want to find ways on my on my own to achieve more so that I could pay for some of those uh, some of those luxuries or niceties that my friends were getting. Do you think that effect affects now your just strong internal drive pro- providing or yes, absolutely. do you think it was a subconscious thing back then or was it oh, fully, sir, fully conscious? Because I, I remember when I grew up, I go to people's houses, they had huge houses you know, and then there are people who had smaller houses. And I, I didn't really put that together like, oh, the parents are uber successful or they're less wealthy. I just was like, oh, this is cool. This is a larger house or smaller house. So I wasn't really thinking consciously at the time. but I wasn't really either. Not about that. But like when, you've, like, when you're a, a, a nerd like myself and you're playing, you know, we, one of the things that was pretty cool is my dad was pretty, pretty hip and interested in the, um, in the, in the personal computing space. So we had like a Commodore 64 growing up. Nice. That was pretty cool. Um, and then like eventually like, you know, Nintendo came out, we got a, we had an Atari. Um, and I heard you talk about that yeah. as a, as a, no as a yeah. Yeah. So we had an Atari growing up. We had Sega Genesis. We had like those game systems. And that, that probably was, was where I saw missing. There was a point in time, I think when like the super Nintendo, uh, came out and like the, um, the Nintendo 64, like that, those at that point in time, we couldn't really afford it. We could up until that point, And then there was a period of time where we couldn't really afford the game mm. system. So then I was having to go over to my buddy's house as a play over there, as opposed to playing at my house. And that's probably the only thing from a conscious level I recognized as a kid. Mm. You're right. I didn't care about the house. Um, although I was a little, um, I was a little, uh, a little embarrassed about my parents, uh, um, lifestyle of like, you know, just having lots of stuff around, like their, their parents went through the great depression. So I totally kind of call them hoarders. It's that depression <laughs> mentality. Yeah. Yeah. Super. So, I mean, I never really liked to be at the house cause there was just stuff everywhere. And, um, so that I've, I'm the opposite now that we keep things pretty, pretty tidy, yeah. um, at my place. I feel like that invades into generations, that thought process of, the depression, like my grandfather was in the depression and totally like, are you not going to finish that? You know, just, yes. you know, um, and I feel like that has seeped into me being around it and I had to consciously, you know, read or listen to certain things. I'm wondering if you had to do the same and, and what you've done. If Absolutely. That's... It totally seeped into my consciousness and you hit the nail on the head with like, you know, uh, like a plate of food, for instance, you know, it was bad, sick and wrong to not finish your plate. So, you know, I was kind of trained from an early age to overeat and that led to me being, you know, obese by the time I was in my mid, you know, my early to mid twenties when I wasn't, you know, you know, super active and, and you know, doing a lot of sports and that sort of stuff that, you know, took me, took me a while to overcome that. So that, that sort of mentality I think is absolutely generationally passed down. How do you overcome it now? Are there certain things that seep into your thinking now that maybe shouldn't cause you're better off than you were, you know, I'm early way on? I'm way more cognizant of my own, like that, like the, you know, the, the always talking, you know, voice, the self-talk in in your, in your voice or in your head. Uh, I've done a lot of, uh, personal development training. Um, I've gone through all the landmark education, Mm. uh, you know, curriculum for living. I've done, um, other, you know, tremendous amount of coaching, uh, neuro linguistic programming, um, just a a ton of different, uh, types of, uh, of training for communication, for you know, personal development, just kind of understanding oneself. Because I, I think that your it's your own limitations that are the number one blocker from your success. So totally, I figure if I can you know find more limitations in my own thinking, my own way of being, if I can knock those down, then that can uh, help me unlock another level of success in front of me. What's an example there? You. You, maybe you have it currently of self-talk and then what you tell internally to negate that. Like sometimes, you know, because of that, what seeped into me, I may see something like, oh, that's really expensive. And like you can't think like that because, you know, so I'm wondering what, what things you thought about that were maybe holding you back and then what you tell yourself internally to just push through them. Cause I'm sure they happen, you know, every week or month or whatever it is. 
A big one, a big one for me right now is I've had um, I've had such a um, I've had such an interesting journey in um, in a multitude of careers, and I I'm a I'm a pretty humble guy. Like I I don't really you know I don't I don't get super excited you know to self brag or self congratulate myself. So I kind of just you know keep my head down and keep working on what I'm working on. And one of the things that I found is that uh, you know especially like with uh, with AdSum, you know the online seller summit, you know some of the some of the stuff I do to put myself out there is. Um, I'm not alone in that. I think, you know, many of us don't feel that what we do innately is our superpowers. So, you know, what we do on our right. own and what we just do day to day, you know, other people look at those and, and they'll comment on, holy crap, that like, that's really special. And then I, that's I normal tend, to you. Yeah. And then for me, yeah, it's kind of normal. I'll kind of like, eh, you know, it's, it's, it's not that big a deal. And I, it's it's not really fundamentally a part of me to um, to really um, kind of open the kimono, so to speak, and, and and share and talk more about that. Plus, I don't feel like I have a, a great perspective on my own to, to be able to actually point that stuff out. So there's kind of an inner circle that that I spend time with, and they'll they'll comment on you know that Nate, that's really interesting, or that's really special, or that's you know really unique, or you should talk more about that, or I want to know more about that. And then that helps me kind of uncover that it's a topic for conversation or it could be something featured, you know, for my community, or I need to share, share more, teach more people about this. And, um, so I'm, I'm constantly having to fight my own, um, maybe, maybe my own dismissal mm. of certain things that aren't as, as special or as impactful as, as they aren't. And just being kind of humble, um, you know, I, I don't really see like the accomplishments that I've done as, as, you know, significant accomplishments. I see that like, I, I still feel in my own journey, I've got such a, a long way to go to, to reach the, you know, whatever destination, which, you know, I know now there is no destination. It is just a journey, but I just kind of like, feel damn that, it. What? I, yeah. So, I mean, that's just kind of how I, I, I look at it now. So I have to continually, you know, remind myself that there, there are things that people are interested in mm. about in my journey and just be, you know, brave and willing enough to share that. Yeah. And another thing too is is overcoming like those challenges where, like, if I if I say something, you know, with certainty because it's that's applied to my life, not everyone's going to agree with it. And getting over the fact that they don't agree with it and just kind of moving on. So that's something that um, you know it's it's really easy to not stand out and and no one hate you. But if you stand out, then there's you're going to have haters. Neat. So what is what is someone who's told you what? A superpowers of yours that you thought was just normal you know most recently um it it is um it, it's been how i have managed to uh to build a business and i've i've scaled it you know an e-commerce business I've, I've i've scaled it both for my own products but also as an agency so selling for others and and then handed it handed it off to a team like i i basically i spend an hour or two a week um checking in with the team but it's it's all on autopilot and mm. um i never really thought that that was that was an accomplishment but it i mean that is kind of the entrepreneur's dream you've got this passive recurring revenue stream that's built on this process and system that you've established and that's afforded me the ability to go work on the online seller summit uh or the you know the, the legends mastermind or be able to actually have an hour-long conversation uh, with you as opposed to working on, you know, something in the business. So yeah. people have commented a number of times and it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty cool thing. I, I, I love the, the, I love that I have the opportunity to do that. And it really has, has been because of just spending time finding the right people, uh, tra teaching the right people and, and helping them grow too and letting them make mistakes. And that was something that was really tough in the beginning is I wanted to, to swoop in and uh, fix and, and solve, you know, problems as opposed to letting them also start to become self-sufficient. What were some of those main important systems you put in place as you were transitioning? Because there was probably a point where you had your hand in everything and there was a point right now where you're kind of overseeing everything. Yep. What were some of those key things you put in place that two, allowed two, you to do that? Two big ones. The, the first big one for me was the finance side of the business. So I, I needed to hire a CFO and I, I hired one. I uh, believe it was 2014, and uh, she is amazing. She is an absolute rock star. Um, she's been with me for years now, and uh, she was able to completely um, 
basically redesign how the accounting, bookkeeping, you know, the invoicing, accounts payable, accounts receivable, like that entire function of my business, she completely took over. I didn't have to do I didn't have to I didn't have to worry about doing any of that anymore. And that freed up a tremendous amount of my time. And then um, the second one was the was the operations. And um, I hired a guy and uh, um, it's been with me for a number of years. His name is Mark Evans, um, you know, started uh, helping me just with, you know, some um, some reports and stuff for the e-com the e-commerce business and the agency. And then over time, it's just taking on more and more and more responsibility and um, and, and now has a senior role and, and manages, uh, you know, a couple other staff members and doesn't necessarily need to be a huge team. And but because we've got uh, the other key thing we found, too, is uh, I have had a pretty good ability to find rock star companies to pay as a service provider to do a lot of work that many companies have to have to um, they have to hire their own staff to do. Mm. So outsourcing found, some 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 of the tasks. Exactly. So having them, I'd say that's probably the third thing. So finance operations and then and, and great um, uh, great service companies that they're you know outsourcing almost has some negative connotation about you know like the Philippines yeah, you know, yeah. outsourcing. It's it's really it's it's kind of more than that. It's almost like strategic partners. Mm-hmm in these service providers. And that's, that's actually kind of the, the, the key cornerstone to, to uh, the online seller summit and add some success is it connects uh, services with sellers. So those great services that can literally take business functions off of the shoulders of entrepreneurs and just do it and do it well. Um, those are, are three key things that have been super helpful to allowing me to, to scale that and also to remove myself from the day-to-day operations yeah. of it. And I know with AdSum, there's a number of service providers you recommend and, or mm-hmm. categories. So I want to talk about that. But going back to the CFO, um, how did you decide it was the right moment? Because I imagine that's a not so clear-cut decision at the time that you're making it. I was super scared. I mean, this is going to be the most expensive employee that I was going to hire. And I used a, um, I used a, a, head, a headhunter to find her. And for those, big, for those type of rock stars, you, you kind of have to. Like, they, people who are awesome are working. So you've got to find them from other, from competitors, from other companies, from different industries. And for her, she had a lot of experience with, uh, with brick and mortar retail. Uh, so she, she'd worked for, um, for, uh, for Gap International, which owns all of the Gap, you know, yeah. brands. Kind uh, of a big, big job. Yeah. A big job, multi, multi billion dollar company, public company. And she'd, she'd, She'd served not as a C level there, but like a couple of rungs down. But you know, at those giant companies, you know, whatever they call like a director or a VP, it's basically like a C level for um, you know for an under hundred million dollar company. And um, yeah, so I just I used a um, I used a headhunter. I paid them twenty percent of her salary in two chunks of payments. You know, over thirty days, which is super scary. And um, but it was the best thing I ever did, and, I, and they helped me find the right person. I interviewed like six people in one day. It was a it was a grueling day of interviews, and she was the last one to come in. And she came in kind of in a in a huff, and I think she, I don't remember if she was kind of late or not. But uh, at that point in time, I basically had given the same elevator pitch to who the hell I am and what I'm doing to five other people. So my energy's low. I'm tired. Um, but uh, it was it was like it was just immediately perfect like it she was. was asking the right questions she mm. knew what she could do to help my company and um and it was yeah one of the best hiring decisions i've ever had what do you no, think the best hiring decision i've ever had yeah what do you think attracted her to your company like you said may, she were, comes from gap she probably could work at a lot of places yeah absolutely. what was it so what she told me is she, she just thought it was a great fit. Like she saw that she could make an impact on our business immediately. So she she wanted to have a uh, an immediate effect, an immediate impact for you know positive for the business. And she, you know she saw a bunch of things that she was kind of like, oh, I'm sorry, sweetie. Like you know we could you know I can fix that for you. And then not yeah. like in a um, not like in, like in a like derogatory a condescending way, way. Yeah. not derogatory whatsoever. It's like okay, well. You know, and the, it's going to take probably 60 days to get up to speed, and then yeah. you know we'll start doing these sprints, and we'll we'll start fixing some of this stuff, and um, and she did, and so she could see tangible you know um, results from yeah. her work right off the bat. What was something that you saw that was a big impact of her coming in and fixing because of you know her expertise? 
uh, upgrading our staff. Um, you know, we had a, we had a, you know, we, we started and, and many startups going to go through this. Like you'll start with a group of, um, a, you know, group of employees that'll get you to a million dollars a year. And then, you know, some may stick around when you move from a million dollars to $10 million. And at some point between, you know, probably 10 million and 25 million, like that early class, um, they go away, you know, and, or, and, or you've got to replace them. Um, and then when you get to like that 25 and, you know, a million and over, you've, you've got an entire new team basically at that point. And we were, we kept bumping that, like we were, we were in this, this area where we were doing, you know, 10 million a year, uh, gross revenue. And we wanted to get, you know, to get past that. And so, you know, hiring her was, was a key piece of basically just restructuring that, that entire finance department. And she brought in, you know, a really, really good bookkeeper, a good, um, you know, she worked with, we had an accountant before her, but she was able to work with them, you know, just, you know, lock in step and, um, and then just, you know, start to, you know, change some tweak and change, you know, staff people, you know, staff members, you know, helping get them, you know, focus on the right thing, separating accounts, payable accounts, receivables, um, you know, doing, you know, managing all the invoicing and that sort of stuff. And, and, I mean, that was something that, she, you know, it wasn't the initial intention. Like I didn't hire and say, hey, she's going to come in and fire everybody and then rehire everybody. Like she worked with the staff that was there. Yeah. And and there was even some turmoil and like some some self, um, you know, kind of like between us. Self-selection. Like, you know, see, there was some self-selection, but there was some turmoil around the staff. Like we wanted to see them succeed. Uh, but at, at the end, um, we probably should have just cut the cord with a couple of folks a little bit earlier than we did. And it, it gave them the opportunity to go out and stretch their wings and do different things too. And sometimes I'm loyal to it's a, a fault. tough decision. Totally. Yeah. So that, that was, uh, that was definitely one impact she made right off the bat. Yeah. So talk about add some and the service provider ac- aspect you were mentioning. Absolutely. So add some came, came about, uh, because when I first got, um, when I first started selling uh, products online, I was basically a passive participant. I was an investor. I was, at the time, I was still working at a bank. I didn't have a whole lot of time uh, to devote to another startup full time. So I, I put my money in. There was somebody else was kind of managing the the process, and part of that was also the service providers that were that were shipping products, that were manufacturing products, labeling products, like that sort of stuff. So they were they were already I kind of walked into a, a setup where someone else was doing some of those major functions, and over time, um, as uh, we had, we you know, we had some rocky starts. Like you know, we went like a mile a minute in the beginning, sold like almost a million dollars worth of supplements and vitamins the first month that we were doing this. Wow. Um, we we had a shipping problem, so a snafu between our ship shipping company and and a carrier uh, dropped the ball, uh, which had a, a chain chain reaction that caused us to lose our credit card processing. So then we had a um, situation where at that point, what was really what was really tough is we had this stretch of success. So like, I think about it kind of like someone that's playing poker or gambling, like you keep winning, you keep winning. So you keep putting in more chips, more chips, more chips. And at one point in time, I'm kind of all in, I, like I'm right. using credit. I'm, you know, by putting credit cards in it. I'm finding well, in a okay, physical products business. It's sort of the more you sell, the more you have to buy inventory. So it's, it's, it's kind of the nature of the beast. It's a volume thing. Like you, you make you make a you know a 15, 20, 25, 30 percent net margin, but you've got to put money into it to keep. You're right. Keep ordering inventory, buying, uh, you know, acquiring customers and, and advertising. So, we what was <laughs> what sucked is good and bad. But what's what was what was tumultuous for me was we had this series of of you know the streaks of success where you know we test you know there's some sales and then boom all of a sudden we're getting like 300 sales a day and it's like. I'm thinking to myself, man, this is this is my ticket to to you know quitting the bank again. At this point in time, I had been an entrepreneur, you know, as a real estate entrepreneur. I had to suck it up in 2008 when things crashed. I actually went back to work and went back into the workforce as an employee, and then I felt like I was this caged animal. I was in jail. I was like my my entrepreneurial spirit was stuck in prison, and then. Along came this opportunity, and almost like within a couple of couple of months, it um, you know it went really really well. So I'm thinking, ah, I found the key. It's like I'm visualizing myself in a in a jail cell, and there's the keys are on the floor in front of me, and I've gotten like this string and something. I've got I've got the keys hooked. It's like an I'm escape really, room. Yeah, I'm reeling it in. I'm getting ready to escape this entrepreneurial prison, you know, that I've been in. And right when I bust out, 
and I and I open this this jail cell door, this dungeon door, like the guards come and tackle me, and and then like you're getting ready to stuff me back in there because I I'd spent I'd invested you know just a, probably twenty thirty thousand dollars in the beginning, and then like that started to scale up. At one point in time, I had over a quarter million dollars invested. And uh, for me having, you know, taken some lumps in the real estate, you know, crash in, in 2008, you know, was, that was a good part of my nest egg. So now I'm looking at this, um, you know, this really like disastrous situation where I can't get, I can't ship products. I can't, you know, accept payments. And that's when I realized I needed to have the best service providers around me. I needed to mm. have the best companies in my corner. And we were, we were able to put together a, like a temporary fix, was able to get, you know, credit card processing going again, you know, got the shipping going again. Um, and, but it was kind of like, you know, it was like I patched a tire. I knew I needed to go in, like I needed to, to go into a pit stop and get a new tire. Um, so Just not enough time. Me, it, yeah, exactly. It got me back in the race. And that's when I went and did, um, you know, kind of over the course of the next several months, you know, doing some research around what would be the best companies to align myself with, to partner with. You know, as a service, you know, they would provide services to me, not as a real partner. I didn't give equity to anybody or anything. Uh, but it, it, it got me to realize that, man, there are some companies out there that are absolutely awesome at what they do. And there are some companies out there that, you know, I'm you not their highest priority. should steer clear from, yeah. Yeah, you should steer clear from. Or, you know, I, I mean, I don't think anyone has it. Has, like, the, I don't feel that people go into business looking to maliciously harm potential clients. Like, but there are times when something gets overlooked or a, you know a problem may escape notice or someone else might have a, um, a you know a, a bigger um, a, you know might, they might be able to influence that company more because they're a bigger client or they're they're more important to them so for me I wanted I wanted to be um, there's two things I really wanted to find is I wanted to find a company that was just rock solid and from a dependability perspective and the second thing I, I found as I was talking to some of these other companies these like fulfillment companies process you know credit card processing companies some of them actually came from a background of selling products mm. so they they actually knew a they lot understood about the, the pains yeah. they, they understood it they understood the pains they had experience like the, i could literally jump on a call with them and talk about the business and I, I was having a problem with something maybe that was outside of their control but they knew enough about it they could point me in the right direction and maybe it was another service company that you know i, I needed to look at next like as my as your company grows, you kind of start you, you start bolting on you know more pieces to continue to flesh it out, and that's that's really where the inspiration for AdSum came um, was was in search for those um, those services, and also I wanted to align myself with and and surround myself with other successful online retailers, and just be able to pick their brain and and also sh you know share my own experience, and that's. That's really where I think my expertise started to um, started to blossom because I found that I was able to attract a number of uh, very successful online retailers to me. And at the time, we didn't officially have a mastermind. We just got together and shared war stories. And people would fly in to, you know, in, you know where, where my office was based or we would meet at other events and I would just rent a hotel room and, and we would hang out and talk and that sort of stuff. And then just over the course of years, like that kept growing. Like people would... It's almost like Fight Club. Like you don't talk about Fight Club. Like that early group <laughs> Rule was, number two. Rule yeah, number one, yeah. Rule number one and two and three. So it's kind of like that as well. It's like we don't really want the group to get any bigger. And then it got to a point where the group either needed to get either needed to get you know way bigger or it, it just needed to change it needed to evolve and that's when uh, when adsum was born so i took uh took all these uh, online retailers and and then you know connecting them with the services that support them because both of them provide a, a very tangible uh, you know um, it's like a benefit for to each other it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship yeah. so creating ad some kind of in the middle of that with uh, retailers and services and then connecting them uh, was a was a completely organic um, event that happened so Nate are there specific types of services like categories of services or specific service providers that yes. you want to mention yep so if you think about it um, the, it's kind of like looking looking at like what Amazon provides Amazon does f the fulfillment they do the customer service they accept the the, the credit card payments uh, they provide the the website slash shopping cart um, you know th those are just some examples so in in the um, in the online sellers universe you need those same things to exist when you're when you're off platform you need to have a website you need to have a shopping cart um, you need to be able to accept payments 
You need to fulfill the, you know, ship the product. You need to have customer service to answer the the customers. You know, where's my package? You know, um, you know, if they have a problem, you can refund it. Uh, and then you need to, you need to um, to have sales. You need to drive traffic. This is what you know the lingo is called. And um, I've got remind me at the end. I'll, I'll give you a, a terminology document I, I put together. I posted on Medium.com. It's got kind of the lingo of performance marketing or affiliate marketing. Um, cause that's a key thing to understanding what the hell every, everything means. Right. So those are some of the categories that exist as service providers at add some. So you can, you can go to that, the online seller summit at add some and literally like go to a couple of booths and find a rock star fulfillment company, a rock star customer service company, a rock star, uh, credit card processing, uh, agency, a, a rock star shopping cart company, um, there's great designers there. So like you can literally do everything. And then once you get it set up, it's done. Like you basically have rebuilt an, a, a, a $1.01 trillion platform to compete with Amazon and you fully control it. That's, that's the beauty of, uh, of the online seller summit and add some like you, you don't have to be, um, you don't have to be under the control of some big platform. And I know a lot of folks do really well on Amazon and that's, that's awesome. I, I outsource my Amazon. So we, we sell products on Amazon and, uh, and off Amazon and 80% of our sales, if not more happen off of Amazon, but there's also, uh, there's an influx of sales on Amazon from my off Amazon sales. So it's, it's really congruent. It's really symbiotic. And people who are selling on Amazon are doing themselves a huge disservice, doing their families a huge disservice by not setting up their own platform, uh, off the, um, off the Amazon, you know, e- ecosystem. And, and they can go to the online seller summit literally and, and walk to six or seven booths and then within 60 days be up and running and, and then not have, to, and then after that, not really have to be doing a tremendous amount of work. They just need to oversee um, some of the operations, or better yet, do like what I did: um, hire hire somebody. You know, when you're making the cash flow for it, and train them and let them do it. And then you literally have this passive business that all entrepreneurs dream of. And go vacation with your family. Go spend time with them, like we all tell ourselves we're going to do, but we end up forgetting about when we're on the journey. So was that what you, you talk a lot about with the seven key partnerships need to diversify off Amazon? Yeah. 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 So yeah, I did a, uh, did a presentation to a group of Amazon sellers uh, on, on a Facebook. Cause that's thing. a big pain point for, especially yeah. cause a lot it's Amazon is so easy. Yep. I'm because they provide all those things, right? Absolutely. So it's like a golden handcuff situation. It, it's exactly right. And I think there's a, there's a big fear that, people who are selling just on Amazon, there's a fear that, well, selling off of Amazon is hard because I don't understand the, the, the technology I need or I don't, I don't understand websites or what are these funnel things? I, I, like, I like funnel cakes. Is, is that what funnels are? You know, no, not quite. Not healthy, um, but no. yeah, so like there, there's things that are missing and, and I'm here to say that it's not that hard. I, I was doing it, you know, when I was working full time at Bank of America, um, you know, and, and afterwards, you know, it's it's a matter of setting up those seven key partners. And in the beginning, it's a couple hours a week, probably over the course of six to eight weeks. And then, uh, boom, you're you're launched. You're ready to go. Just watch the sales. Make sure the customers are, are getting what they're expecting. Um, and uh, and you just kind of you don't have to make it complicated. And I I tell you, I spent a lot of time and I wasted a lot of money because I just didn't have a blueprint for how to do it. I didn't have a resource like what AdSum serves for people now. I didn't have anybody to ask these questions to. I was three years in before I found another online retailer. I'd been selling in 2012, 13, and 14 until I finally found some, finally a, um, one of my service providers, someone who was, who was helping me acquire customers and doing the advertising. They introduced me to a competitor. And they kept telling me ahead of that, it's like, eh, you know, your, your competition, Nate, why, why would they want to talk to you? I'm like, well, I don't know. Maybe we can share something that's beneficial for each other. And it, it finally, um, I'll, I'll give full full call out to, uh, to ClickBooth. Lee Aho from ClickBooth introduced me to Steve Miles, who was the first other retailer I met. And Steve is one of my best friends mm. to this day. We've been through wars together and <laughs> on, yeah. online e-commerce war, like, you know, trudging through, you know, finding the best service providers and finding the best solutions. And, and that, that key, you know, first relationship got me thinking that, you know, and as I came from real estate, there's 
the real estate's really mature. People, I mean, obviously buying land has been around for a long time. Um, selling online has really been kind of the last couple decades sort of thing. So there wasn't really a um, a community that existed in the beginning. And man, there's so much to learn by being around others that are doing it. So uh, hats off to uh, to the ClickBooth folks and, and Lee for introducing me to Steve because that started you know, the hundreds of online retailers that now are a part of AdSum and the Online Seller Summit that you can just sit and hang out and have a cup of coffee or drink a beer and talk with them and, and literally just have a, a common place to relate to others that know your frustrations and your fears and your challenges. And because most of us, you know, if, we, if we're selling products online, we can't really have that kind of conversation with our, like, we can't have a meaningful conversation about that day's frustrations with our spouses or with our children or our friends. Like they're working jobs or they're doing other stuff. Like they just don't get it. And, um, but, you know, being able to do that with others, there's, there's power in that. And then there's, there's amazing power in getting a whole bunch of us together because, um, there, there's a tremendous amount of influence that we can, uh, that we can exert. And that, you know, that part is, is really beneficial to everybody from a business sense. And then, um, you know, it's, it's just an awesome thing to do. Yeah. I mean, it's hugely powerful. And I feel like, especially, I don't know, I've noticed in e-commerce specifically, it's a lot of industries, people can be secretive. Um, or they don't want to share, but I, what I find the most successful ones don't have that scarcity mindset. They want when they collaborate, and they realize when they collaborate, even like you said with a competitor, it explodes their business because you're sharing things that both of you can benefit from. So, how do you get over that initial inkling of well, I could share something, he could knock it off, or how did you get over that with Steve, or had yep. that mindset around it? Well, so in in the health and beauty world, and in, in just let's just look at health for a second. There, there as as a product, um, there is a zillion things you can sell, and there's you know billions of people looking to buy stuff. Like the market is huge, yeah. uh, so it's kind of like the way that I I equate it is you know think about um, uh, you know, uh, of stock traders. This on may a stock be floor. Nate why people hesitate to come to add some. I don't know. They like I don't yeah. want anyone to know what I'm doing. Absolutely. So, so think about it this way: the, the market is huge. So, if you are, uh, if if you're trading S and P 500 shares, like the ETF on on S and P, for instance, you're sitting literally, you know, maybe in Chicago or New York on a trade room floor with a bunch of other people that are also trading the same stocks. But the market is so big, there's very little chance that you're going to affect the market. Like you're, that like you're going to move it. You know, there in some cases that happens to the, some of the big boys, but for for most companies that are selling less than a hundred million dollars a year, the ad sum audience is that you know is that hundred thousand dollars to a hundred million dollars a year. A lot of them are a million dollars and up, and about eighty one percent are a million and up, and forty nine percent are ten million and up. And what I would say to them is. Uh, you know, live an abundant lifestyle and share. You know, what are the challenges that you're that you're going through, and be willing to be open to to your competition. And you know, maybe you don't need to give them the exact secret recipe of the formulation of your your hair tonic or your lotion or oil or whatever it is. You don't need to like specify that. But there are outside forces that are not in alignment with your businesses. So you kind of have a common enemy. Um, in some cases, it's Amazon. You know, Amazon is. Uh, you know, they, they're looking at what's selling and then they are rolling out their own white label versions of the same thing. Like right. it's, it, Walmart does that. That's what the great value brand is. Costco does that. That's what Kirkland is. So they bring products into the store, find out what sells great. And then they white label it themselves and offer it under their, their generic brand. Amazon's doing the same thing. So, you know, I would say that you're actually in, in more of a, a challenging situation when you're, when you're siloed, when you're isolated than if you're together with others because at least then you've got you've got multiple inputs that you can reference to help you make decisions as opposed to uh, we saw this one thing happen so it must be true therefore I must now do this totally what are some of your favorite resources you mentioned Clickbooth what are some uh, of your yes. other favorites so um, uh, from a from a tr from a manufacturing perspective, um, there's some really great companies out there that that can white label products for you. So, like a new, uh, whether you're new or not, even even I was just hearing this the day, like you know, you know, billionaires when they're starting business ventures and stuff, you don't just throw money at the problem. You you the business unit needs to stand on its own quickly, viably, profitably. So I look at every new. 
um, you know, er every new person that comes to add some or everyone that's been before is, is constantly, oh, what's the lowest hanging fruit? How can I, you know, squeeze the most juice, um, you know, out of this, out of this fruit? And I think what's a, what's a great opportunity for people is if you're looking at anything in the health and beauty you know universe, there are companies that contract manufacture or white label stock formulations. So it's literally like a blank bottle on a shelf. All you do is slap your label on it. You create your own brand. You get your own logo. You get that put on it. You don't. In some cases, you don't have to come out of pocket to buy a thousand units or five thousand units. They have it on demand. So you can literally create logos and labels for 500 bucks to a thousand bucks and then you know you can sell it you can actually sell it on amazon these companies will do it where they can they will fulfill they they will literally um uh, set it up label it get it ready to go fulfill it amazon prime and everything uh right from their uh from their um uh from their stores that that particular company is called private label skin and uh, they're sponsored at some. They'll be there with uh, with a booth and in full glory. I've I've used them uh, off and on throughout the years, and uh, an absolutely a big advocate of them. Uh, we talked about um, uh, the uh, credit card processing. That's another big you know gotcha. That was the first kind of you know hiccup I had. Um, it's a big the, hiccup. Yeah, it's a huge shut hiccup. You down. And I see this all the time. I see people selling on on Shopify, and and you know when they're selling on their own platforms, they just plug in Stripe and PayPal, and um, that's okay to start, but you like, I'm not the kind of person that wants to have all, all my eggs in one basket and Stripe and PayPal are aggregators. So you don't really, and you are a tiny fish in their huge pond. So if anything ever happens, you are a nobody to them. They will shut you down. They will send you a letter. You will not see your money for six to 12 months and you know, have a nice day, go to jail. Um, uh, so what I recommend there's a company that uh, uh, that I recommend is, is called PaySafe, and they provide credit card processing for uh, in the online e-commerce universe for information products for pretty much anything, and uh, they know what uh, what you know the universe looks like, and they have various options for people selling different things using different billing models. Different billing models will. Um, you know, will will affect um, you know your your pricing and then like the risk tolerance and stuff. So that's a key partner. Uh, your customer service. Um, been a big advocate of a company out of Phoenix called Alpha Connect. Um, they've been doing my customer service for a long time. They've they've done a, a great job of it. Um, the owner used to sell products online as well, so I used to ask him questions in the beginning, and he would help me. He would you know literally you know you should try this, you should try that, you know do this, do that. Um, so that, that was a, a big one. Um, and then, uh, let's see, what are some other ones? So tr from a traffic perspective, some people are worried that you're not going to be able to, okay, so Nate, all right, I, I'm drinking your Kool-Aid. I want to set up a website. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, do a platform. I'm going to, I'm going to compete with Amazon and no, it's not going to compete with Amazon. You're actually going to collaborate with them and here's how you do it. So, uh, the, you need to get sales. And I'm actually not a big fan of trying to run your own, like do your own Facebook ads, trying to run your own, you know, paid media. Um, I'm not a big fan of that in the beginning because that's a whole skill set that you don't really have time to go and learn. You're busy setting up your business. Like you need to focus on, you know, getting your infrastructure set up. So I outsource that. And those companies come to add some. Uh, a couple of them that'll be there is uh, Direct Focus Online. They're great at, um, at selling like gadgets and electronics and you know, uh, consumer, consumer type products. Um, a, another one is, um, is Affiliati, the Affiliati network. They specialize in selling a ton of stuff, but well, I've always, uh, I've always used them for, uh, selling health and beauty type products. Um, another one is a company called convert to media. And I, I can send you uh, Jeremy, if you think it'd be beneficial, my, totally. my approved vendor list, um, my, my approved service. It's super list. valuable. Yeah, yeah. I, you're right. I mean, this, Finding those companies has literally cost me millions, and it's taken me More. years. Yeah, and um, so I, I kind of you know I've got a cheat sheet so to speak, um, or a checklist of these companies that you can go and talk to. And um, let's see. So where else are we? Uh, You're saying uh, traffic. So, yeah, so traffic. So we've got a couple of providers there that that do uh, that. That literally, it's a phone call. So one of the things that people um, and, and I didn't understand this in the beginning either is this is entirely a relationship game. Like in, in order to, to have the best relationship with these service providers and allowing them to bolt on major functions and you can outsource major functions of your business, you need to get to know them. 
you, I, you need to literally talk with them. Like it's not it, you don't go and fill out some survey and plug in some information about your business. The good often. ones, right? They want to understand your business a little bit so they can help Ab- you. Absolutely, and it doesn't take a ton of time, but spend an hour on the phone with them, and then you know you get set up and, and off and running you go. Um, so that's those are some key things. You know, again, kind of reiterating, you know, what the what the um, you know what the value is of going to events. And, and, you know, my own experience was in 2000, was 2014, I think it was in 2014, Supercorm Stan- Sandy uh, swooped into New York City. And I went to an event just after that called Ad Tech. And they're having, they're having some challenges. I don't think it really exists quite the way it did. But at that event, at that time, there were traffic providers. So ad networks, affiliate networks, other companies that I could go and talk to. That's actually where I met Lee from ClickBooth. And then later he introduced me to Steve. So it was that that one on one face to face relationship. It always makes a big difference. Face to face. It makes a it makes a huge difference. It completely shortcut the entire time of me having to just call around to all these companies on my own. So, you know, going to an event where they're all together and you can literally you can see someone face to face and you just you establish a level of rapport with them, a relationship with them that is far more than if you're just sending emails and phone calls and Skype messages. Hundred percent. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, and I'll post it, and then make sure that you tell them Add Some sent you if you call any of these people. Please, um, yeah, let them know that Nate's singing their yeah. praises. They, yes. they want they want to hear that uh, that what you know their their participation in the event has yeah. uh, has results. You know, Nate, um, thank you for your time. I know you have a million things to do, especially with the event coming up, and so um, people should check out Add Some. Uh, dot net. Um, but I have one last question and then I'll have you talk about any other sites because I know you have the Legends uh, Mastermind and so we want to send people to where they can find out more at all those places. Um, so I always ask what has been, you know, since Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment and how you push through and what's been um, a high point for you. Um, and at the end, I do want to just say it's amazing the health transformation you went through um, because I know you've talked about it in the past that it's hard to believe um, looking at you, but you used to be 360 pounds. Yeah, um, so absolutely. that is a crazy transformation itself. But um, just start with what's been, what's been a low moment business-wise and a high moment. And then I just want you to talk a little about that, that transformation at the end. The low moment definitely was that that point in time where I thought I had broken out of entrepreneurial jail, and I, I had uh, now this e-commerce business going, and it looked like things were just you know going to be an amazing success, like I just hit a grand slam, and then like about two months into it, just having this snafu. Um, you know, disrupt the business. Uh, and I, I remember uh, it was around July 4th of 2012, um, thinking I was going to go into bankruptcy. And that, you know, this after doing a million dollars a month in after. Yep. Know. After having this initial success, I thought I was going to lose it all. And mm-hmm. I remember laying in bed next to my wife one night and telling her, sweetie, I think I may have bankrupted us. Mm. And um, just the amazing support my wife gave me at that time that we'll get through it was like that rock for me to stand on. Yeah. And and to then just kind of like gird my, you know, kind of gird myself and and get back out there and just start looking for, okay, how are we going to solve this? Um, that was definitely one, one of the, one of the lowest points because I just felt that, you know, again, as a provider, like it's, it's, it's on me right. to bring it's the, the identity as a provider. And then that happens. Absolutely. What did she say to you when you told her that she, you know, she, she was just like really, you know, realistic about it. It's like, okay, well what then, what, you know, what happens, you know, what happened? Let's just say worst case scenario, you do go into bankruptcy. Well, I mean, there's been some of the most prominent businesses and businessmen in the world have gone through bankruptcy. Mm. Like, that's not the end. Of, that's not the end of the story. Like, that's, you know, so what? So, you know, let's, you know, do everything that we can to to avoid that. And one of the things that she said is, you know, what can I do to help? Like, how can I support you? And, uh, the, you know, the time she was working a full time job and I was like, you know, I, sweet, I, I need you to, you know, keep doing what you're doing, you know, help, you know, help bring in, you know, income. We had just bought a house, you know, earlier that year. Um, you know, so we had, you know, this, this new mortgage payment, we were expecting our firstborn. Uh, so there was, <laughs> there was a lot of stress I was, I had, I'd put on my shoulders. Two big stresses. Huge yeah. stresses. In a good and, way, uh, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, so that, that was definitely, um, was, was a real, was a real rocky place, you know, for me, 
but she was just a huge support at that moment. And, and that I feel like that it was kind of like it filled up the energy in my, in my, my energy tank. And I was Mm -hmm. able to, you know, get back out there and just start, you know, brainstorming, problem solving, you know, problem solving, just, you know, reaching out to companies and figuring out what we needed to do. And that's where we were able to figure out how to, you know, how to kind of plug those holes that we were having. And, and, you know, we weren't back up to full speed on the, on that racetrack again, but we at least didn't have a flat tire. Yeah, I mean, I, I love what she said there, and I feel like when I listen to, I don't know if you listen to the Shoe Dog book, the founder of Nike, but I feel that's kind of entrepreneurial therapy, because if you see someone as big as Nike go through, you hear that it's that's normal, and that happens, and the up and then the down, but you don't see the, you don't see behind the scenes of, oh yeah, it looks like a huge company, but it's, you know taking out money, millions of dollars, to fund the shoes or the supplements or whatever it is, it's, uh, I felt it was like therapeutic. So, I mean, that's kind of the sentiments that she's saying to you. Yep, absolutely. And, and there, those stories exist, I think, for all of us. Um, that's another thing that you talked a little bit earlier about, uh, you know, what are, what are things that I struggle with? And it's, it's, uh, it's a struggle to, be, to, be, to share candidly those vulnerable moments. We, we are not programmed to do that i think we are we are programmed to you know beat our chests and show our big shiny cars and our big houses and put up this facebook yes (laughs) yeah you know put up this um you know this 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 facade air air of inauthenticity is something it's probably a survival mechanism I, i imagine you know yeah so that's uh so that's a that's a deep dark uh, sentiment, yeah. but it, it led to a uh, you know fabulous transformation in the business, and um, it was a, it was about that time I was uh, I was going through my own physical transformation as well, and and uh, you know I was losing um, you know I was, I was losing weight and, and getting that part of my life together, um, you know that, that kind of the physical part of it, and the same time then I'm going through this you know this turmoil with the business and and like just that you know hope is a is a powerful thing and. The potential loss of hope is devastating, and and just remembering, you know, I, I felt so ashamed that the real estate business was no longer a viable business. Like the mar- market forces outside of my control, and the housing bubble, and the change in economics and stuff was just so, yeah. you know, the magnitude of it was so big. I felt like a failure and and a shame that I was going back to work again just to myself. Um, you know, no one else cared. I mean, I'm making a living and paying the bills and stuff like no one cared about that. But to me, I felt like I had failed in, in, in that journey. And, and being an entrepreneur, I think is very much like a, you know, it, it is a, a personal pursuit. It's a personal journey. Um, so yeah, to have yeah. that rock bottom moment was, was excruciating. And then, uh, to leave on a high note, uh, the very first ad sum, I'd say, was was a high note um, because it was a a shift from it was a paradigm shift for me, where I stopped serving my own needs, and and trying to provide just for my own family and and just you know make money for my you know myself and my employees was kind of that inner circle, and ad sum was really the first moment where I saw that if I provide for everyone else's needs and if I connect people in a way that they've never been able to connect with with the community before and and help them achieve success that i would i would be so much more fulfilled and uh, i it took me a while to to learn i didn't i didn't realize why i felt so um uh, so abuzz with ad and why I was so in, in, in love with, you know, creating that event and, and, and providing, you know, this sort of connection with everybody. And it wasn't until I read the five love languages that I realized that deep down, um, uh, you know, what I express my love for others by providing acts of service to them. And, and I receive love from others by, by receiving words of affirmation. So, you know, what that means for me is I, I like to do service for others. I like to, to provide value to others. Like, that's how I just innately show my love. And it, it took me a while to figure that out. But looking back subconsciously, I had been doing that for years. I was networking with guys like Steve Miles. Yeah. I created these small events with, you know, bring in 35 guys, then bring in 45 and 80 and then 100 and then 200. I was doing that at the same time as running my own business. And I wasn't getting paid for any of it. Um, I was breaking even. I was, you know, I was. I was um, Sometimes you know, those, you know, relationships and advice is invaluable. 
Absolutely. I mean, there was a number of reasons why, you know, why I would do that. I was getting, you know, intelligence and information and, and, and things that were helping my business, but like it as a business wasn't a viable business. It was just something I was doing because I love to do it. And then at AdSum that first year, just, you know, seeing the difference it was making for people and then hearing the buzz that came from it. Like it was a really small niche of the world. It was, you know, people selling health and beauty products using performance marketing and, you know, have their own websites and stuff. Like it's a super tiny, you know, niche, but it, it was, it was enough. And now every year that it's continued to grow, it just, it, it literally, it is soul food. It just feeds my soul to do that event and I can't help but do it. Nate, thank you for sharing. There's so much to unpack, but to unpack it, you will have to go to AdSum. So uh, check out AdSum.net. Uh, where else should we point people towards online? Yeah, so you can um, you definitely add some .net. Uh, it's October fourteenth, uh, fifteenth, and sixteenth. Uh, it is the ultimate destination for online sellers. And uh, another place that you can find out more information about stuff I do is I, I've got kind of my my inner circle guys that you know have have done some some pretty amazing things. They're um, you know they've they've been down the down the the road path of of success and had their own trials and tribulations. And we have a mastermind for. Uh, for my inner circle it's called uh the legends mastermind and it's the legends.io the legends.io and it's uh uh you you know for folks that are are doing seven figures or more a year as an as a an online entrepreneur it's a it's a great venue to um to whittle down and get to the brotherhood of of nate's inner circle it's uh it's very much a um a fraternal gathering for the the closest to me and it's uh it's it's four four events a year we get together and we we uh we over you know we overcome help each other overcome our obstacles and then um and then achieve the maximum uh the maximum benefit from um opportunities that are in front of us too Nate, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out thelegends.io and add something.net. Thanks a lot, Nate. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.